Welcome back to Dorsey's Food Summit. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Jack Herter, who will introduce our panelists to be discussing the 2023 Farm Bill. Thank you, Morgan, and welcome everybody to the second panel of Dorsey's Annual Food Summit. Uh, I'm Jack Herter, I'm an attorney in our food, uh, beverage, and agribusiness practice group, um, and am a, a veteran of uh, Farm Bill debates, and am very much looking forward to uh, hearing from our panel today. Um, in our panel, we're joined by uh, three experts in this space. Um, our first panelist is Chuck Spencer. He is the executive director of uh, government relations at Growmark. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience in the industry and has been deeply involved in uh, a number of farm bills. Um, he's uh, active in trade associations and has had leadership roles at the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, of which Dorsey's also a member. Um, Chemical Industry Council, Illinois Farm Bureau, Crop Life America, American Seed Trade Association, among others. There we go, pardon me. Thank you, Lori. Um, and uh, as you can see from his bio, he has a very well-rounded um, view um, into the industry. Our second panelist is Tina May. Uh, who's Vice President of Rural Services and Chief of Staff to the CEO um, at Land Lakes. Tina's career has been in and around ag policy um, uh, in its entirety. Um, she has the unique distinction of being the only person in modern history to both write and then uh, be asked by a president's administration to implement a farm bill. Uh, so she has this wealth of experience that she'll bring to our conversation. Uh, prior to her current position, uh, she was appointed by President Obama to be the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, um, and also served a previous stint in his administration. Um, she was also the uh, uh, Policy Director for the Senate Ag Committee, um, and is a veteran of two farm bills, the 08 Farm Bill, which uh, in which she advised her home state Senator Tom Harkin, um, on its drafting and passage, and also the 2014 Farm Bill. Our final panelist is Jonathan Coppas. Um, Jonathan is an assistant uh, professor at the Illinois College, University of Illinois College of Agriculture, and is also the director of the Gardner um, Agricultural uh, Policy Program. Um, Jonathan, like everyone else on our panel, has a wealth of experience in food and ag policy. Um, prior to his current role, he was the uh, chief counsel to the Senate Ag Committee, where he helped um, craft, amend, and pass the 2014 Farm Bill. And uh, his keystrokes on the computer uh, are what resulted in many of the laws that we're living under today in this space. Um, Prior to that, President Obama appointed Jonathan to serve as the administrator of the Farm Services Agency, which is the agency within USDA that oversees uh, farm safety programs. So really important role. And before that, um, he worked for uh, my home state senator, Senator Ben Nelson, uh, where I, I worked with him as an intern in that office, if you can remember way back in the day. So before we get into the discussion of uh, what to expect in this upcoming Farm Bill, I think it's useful to give a brief primer on what exactly is a Farm Bill. So Farm Bill is, the Farm Bill is omnibus legislation that authorizes all of our nation's food and ag policies. Um, it is, um, it expires um, every five years. And if it's allowed to expire, uh, there are some pretty serious consequences. Um, a number of our food and ag policies would revert back to New Deal era laws, um, which you know means uh, supply controls and price regimes, which is a very serious consequence. This sunsetting provision um, uh, has done a good job of uh, keeping Congress on track. Uh, the Farm Bill has never been allowed to 
expire in a way where you know the market felt consequences but we've gotten very close um and during my time on capitol hill uh, was a particularly close call in uh the 2014 farm bill debate so what's in the farm bill uh, when people hear the term farm bill uh it, it's likely that the types of policies that come to mind are you know supports that we have in our country for farmers and um, things that relate to you know plows in the soil and and uh, seeds in the dirt but in actuality the farm bill is very broad legislation it covers a lot of ground uh, and it's complex you pull a thread here another thread pops out there um, and some of the topics uh, that um, are included in this large omnibus um, legislation are um, conservation agricultural trade agricultural research forestry the united states forest service is within uh, is housed within the department of agriculture horticulture rural development farm credit um, and obviously the the farm support programs that i referenced earlier um, of all these titles in the farm bill by far the largest one is the nutrition title um, which is a critically important policy for our country. Um, the nutrition title authorizes and sets the policies for um, our, uh, the, the, our nutrition assistance program, SNAP, um, which is formerly known as food stamps and is the government program that uh, many low-income Americans rely upon uh, to feed their families. So this breakout is, um, I think it's shown well by this, um, this spending chart. Uh, this comes from the USDA Economic Research Service, and it's based on projections of the current farm bill we're living under, which is, which is the 2018 farm bill. You can see from the chart, about um, uh, three quarters of the projected farm bill outlays make investments into nutrition. Um, roughly 16%, uh, go into the farm safety net, which I consider to include um, investments that USDA makes in crop insurance, uh, as well as investments that uh, the department makes into commodity programs. A really important 7% of the farm bill is invested in conservation policies. Um, we'll hear a bit more about those policies later today, but they're a critical component of the farm bill and also a a critical component of the political coalition that makes these farm bills possible. And then all those other policies that I mentioned um, in the slide that detailed the various titles of the farm bill um, are tucked into this 1% here. Uh, the 1% is slightly misleading uh, because there are many authorities uh, administered by USDA that uh, actually operate at no cost to the government. Uh, they're lending and credit programs that also form a critical part of um, our country's commitment to rural America. Um, and uh, it's possible we touch on some of those topics later in our discussion. Um, so uh, now we're going to segue into the first part of our panel discussion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Chuck Spencer um, is, uh, is every year or every farm bill very active in uh, its deliberation and debate and is certainly um, a part of those discussions right now. Um, so I'll start off with a, a question to Chuck, which he's going to spend um, maybe a little extra time answering. So uh, Chuck, and, and by the way, uh, your screen is down here. So when I'm like that, I'm looking at you, Chuck. <laughs> So Chuck, when uh, you know you're out there, you're in DC, you're taking meetings, you're working through your trade associations. Um, what are you hearing? What 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 are people expecting uh, will be important issues in this upcoming debate? Wow, that's a uh, that's a timely uh, question you've asked because we are engaged in this process right now. There are field hearings going on throughout the United States by the congressional leaders. The uh, commodity associations and ag associations are developing their policies 
right now for what they anticipate to be the d- discussion that goes on. <clears throat> and I got to, whenever we look at farm bill development, I want to look at it through this lens is that we always look at farm bill policy as the ability to transcend one poor price or production year to the next. So as you know, our food production system and farmers are critical infrastructure for our country. We were deemed essential workers through COVID. We had to work because in North America, we have one opportunity to get planting done and accomplished that would produce a crop that we could harvest. So we have one opportunity in the fall to harvest those crops. Not only does our country uh, rely on it, but so much of the world relies on our exports as well. What people are discussing, you know, it seems easy that you say, well, the Farm Bill field hearings are going on. Are people putting policy positions forward? Yes, they are. There are themes that are being developed, but I want us to look at this perspective. Farm bills tend to be regional. You know, we've got production areas of the country where you have the Eastern shore that has cropping practices that may be a little fresh market oriented, but a lot of cranberries, some corn, soybeans, but then you have the corn belt through the Midwest. You have wheat productions uh, through the plains. You have cotton and rice, peanuts in the Southeast, cotton, dairy, rice in the West as well. Those things matter because there's a lot of regional discussions when it comes to farm policy. And why I bring that up is I want to take a little bit of a political look too here, because this all guides what I'm going to say where we're at right now with our discussions. You look at the committee structures, committee structures of the House Agriculture and Senate Agriculture Committees. Right now, Chairman David Scott from Georgia, second most senior member is Jim Costa from California. Ranking member would be Congressman Glenn Thompson of Pennsylvania. And then the second most senior is Congressman Austin Scott from Georgia. Now you'll notice that the Pennsylvanian is a person that's not from the South <clears throat> during this farm bill development. And I say that because there tends to be a lot of Southern uh, members of Congress and the Senate on the committees well positioned uh, to get those crops taken care of. In the Senate, you got the Debbie Stabenow from Michigan, second most seniors, Patrick Leahy from the Northeast. And then you've got John Bozeman, Arkansas, is going to be a staunch supporter of rice, cotton, peanut programs, as well as a second most senior, Mitch McConnell. Now, the the politics that we talk about, there's a lot of discussion about what would occur if we see the political calculus come into play. Only two times in the last 87 years has the party in the White House kept the majority. And that was in 34 and 2002. So the average loss of seats by the party in the White House is 28. So if you think about that, what we're going to see is potential ranking member Thompson from Pennsylvania move into the chairman's seat in the House of Representatives. And I think most of with all the projections going strongly in that direction. But we all know projections are projections and votes count. So we're going to have to see what November brings. But the the point is, is at this point in time, uh, producer groups are saying very general uh, statements about what they want to see as common themes. Safety nets needed. Jack, you pointed out there are 12 titles in the Farm Bill. And spend much of the time, like the current slide up there, where Title I gets 75 to 80 percent of the discussion. You have some discussion over crop insurance and conservation. But Title I was a safety net component. So you have price loss, average risk coverage programs, and then crop insurance. And what we're hearing is the producer groups want to have those work seamlessly because agriculture is a risk-based process. And we have family farms that are primarily the providers of these um, food structure systems. So we want to make sure that they stay in place to survive a one poor price or weather event into the next production season. And that's why we see a lot of discussion at this point in time. I fully expect pressure to be put on um, the reference prices that are in the farm bill at this point in time. They're below the current market prices. I also want to add that we have other experts on the panel here. We'll certainly could get into details. But the the good part about this 2018 farm bill is it does use Olympic averages for reference prices. So they can adjust over time. The question at the producer level would be, do we have the time to wait for those adjustments? 
So the prices of fertilizer and everything else have gone up. I think that's something that is going to be in the political calculus. And we're starting to see reflected in comments so far in field hearings. Um, so very helpful uh, table setting there, Chuck. When, when you, um, you, you mentioned this idea that um, our, our, our safety net programs need to be updated to reflect the, the current realities and that there's a waiting game when you have an Olympic average built into a, a farm program. Um, are you seeing urgency out there in rural America or are things going okay? Well, I mean, the last two years, there's an urgency in the thought of what happens if our commodity prices decline in value faster than the cost of our inputs. So as we know in, in the marketplace and economics, the best thing for high prices is high prices, they say. We see demand destruction in some of our uh, gasoline prices that we all probably pay attention to. Some may have their electric cars, but even energy prices of electricity have been going up. So at what point in time do consumers take this break where uh, we actually see demand decline, prices will then follow. So when it comes to commodities, as long as the farmer's price and market price can be at a point where they're going to be making a profit, they're going to be concerned they're certainly interested in making sure their safety net is viable and up to date. But I would say that the previous year's production and this year's production looks reasonable for returns at the farm gate. As I said, the critical factor will be if there is a decline in their valuation of commodity prices that is faster than their cost of inputs. And that's going to be a, a critical thing to watch. That makes sense. So, Chuck, what I'm hearing from you is, um, you know, here as we sit today, uh, you know, prices out there are pretty good, um, but input costs are high. And a lot of that has to do with um, exogenous shocks to the market, um, a world power invading Ukraine, um, which is a tragedy. Um, and these are things that uh, the Ag committees are going to have to wrestle with when they decide what's the appropriate level to support farmers. Is that is that the takeaway? Absolutely. And when you said, you know, an invasion like Ukraine, none of us would have thought of that. It made me think about how many different events we've experienced. 40 year high inflation, um, the, the events in Ukraine. Fortunately, we've had rain. I'm going to I want to share with all of us, Jack, that uh, if through a lot of the production areas, there's always weather variability. So when I say we've had rain and it's fortunate, someone out there may be talking to the screen saying, no, we don't, we're dry and we're gonna be hurt really bad. Uh, but what we also see in the policy discussion world is there can be uh, current weather events that play into the role. We have had rains across a number of production areas. Some places are gonna be dry, some places are gonna be too wet. Uh, but I would say for in the Corn Belt particularly, uh, you would have had a much different perspective if we had not seen rains because we were on that knife's edge of whether we were going to have a good crop or not. So yes, you're, you're, you're pointing out uh, some things that are very important in the policy development circles and discussions of farm bill. Yeah, so um, that's interesting. When, when you um, uh, mention um, yield losses from adverse uh, growing conditions, that that's separate and apart from price pressures from market volatility, and um, earlier you you referenced this idea of a, a reference price. Um, that's something I'm going to pick up in a bit with uh, Jonathan, who um, has wrestled with that concept for a decade. Um, but I, I think that's useful for everyone to know. You know, the task of a, of a farm safety net is identifying the best way to um, help farmers when they have a steep revenue loss from price or yield. And, uh, you know, the difficulty is deciding what's, what's the appropriate level. Do you agree with that, Chuck? I do. It's, it's a challenge. In, in farm bills of past, uh, sometimes the emotion of the current can embed itself in a five-year law. And so then the, the reference prices and pricing in a farm bill can become too high everything, including inputs, drops down 
then the farm bill and the government program becomes the place of, of highest price. And that is absolutely not what most farmers would like to see. They would like to see the market send the signal to production. They would like the farm bill to be uh, oriented toward um, market prices, the ability to export and free market systems with trade pro uh, programs that are put in place when it comes to the United States producer. So that's where the majority of thinking is. Go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I, I hear that sentiment all the time from farmers, but um, you know that's occasionally in tension with the design of our farm program. Um, so that's a balancing act. We, we always have to walk. And that's a theme of, uh, you know, at least the past four farm bills. Absolutely. So, is. And, and farm bills yeah. will be more evolutionary than revolutionary. And I think we're setting ourselves up for that this time, too. Yeah, I've I've heard that, and I think that's a um, uh, a good way of putting it. I've I've heard that you mentioned that Chuck, and I've I've also heard our friends at CHS mention it, and um, a nice piece written by their um, Washington representative. Um, so, uh, Chuck, before we break it open to the bigger panel, um, if you had to pick two or three distinct topics that are um, are going to be kind of the, the you know the main areas of focus in this upcoming farm bill. You've mentioned farm safety net policy. Any others you see likely being uh, kind of a battlefront? I do. I do. One will be the budget itself. You you put up the the chart that actually is still up there. Four hundred twenty eight billion. The Congressional right. Budget Office just did a new analysis, and of course, a lot of people may think that the government. And policymakers don't pay attention to budgets, but I think all on this panel understand very clearly there are budget realities. And the new score for the 23 uh, farm bill could be as high as $1.3 trillion. They do that on a 10-year time horizon. So it'd be the 23 through 2032 time period, where instead of 76% for nutrition, it'd be 85% for the Supplemental Nutrition Access Program. And then the commodities conservation and crop insurance would hold relatively stable percentages as far as total spend as compared to the 2018 Farm Bill. So I think there's going to be a lot of discussion over nutrition, Jack. I think, okay. as you know, there's going to be urban members. That's how they vote on farm policy is the stability of urban uh, food systems and food system production as well. And then enhanced yeah. for beginning farmers, I think, will still be part and of discussion as well. And we cannot overlook the importance of conservation and climate. Uh, climate change discussions are entering itself into the discussion and will be a distinct component of this farm bill. Perfect, thank you, Chuck. Uh, so my next question is for you, Tina. Um, Tina, you're a veteran of two farm bills um, and have, have really gotten into the weeds and taking a leadership role in the Senate Ag Committee on uh, on the drafting process. Could you kind of walk us through the process? What, what's happening behind the scenes, what people are seeing? Yeah, thanks, Jack. Thanks for pulling us together too. Um, every process, every farm bill process is different. Uh, there are no two that are alike. Uh, I think too, it's important to remember, you know, we talk about the farm bill sort of sometimes as the legend and the lore, the myth of the farm bill. It's just yeah. a legislative vehicle, right? Sometimes I think we get wrapped wrapped up in, you know, the history and the, I like how Chuck said the emotion and the feeling of it. You know, typically what happens and nothing's ever typical, right? The process starts in the house, right? Chuck did a great job of describing the process that's happening now. The committees have been having hearings in DC and you've seen both house and Senate have, have hearings uh, and pull together information from constituents out in the field. Uh, they'll then move to a chairman's mark in the committee where the committee staff will draft a complete farm bill and they'll drop that and bring that to committee for open debate and amendment. Uh, and then once you pass out of committee, then what typically happens is you, uh, you twist arms and you beg <laughs> uh, the speaker uh, for floor time. Uh, once you've uh, passed that gauntlet, uh, you then are wide open on floor debate. Now House is different. Obviously you have to go through rules committee. Uh, Senate is a little bit more open. 
uh, with, with uh, floor procedure. Uh, once you pass out a house, it'll move over to the Senate. Uh, you'll pick it up on the Senate side, move through uh, floor action, and then you'll move to a conference committee where the chairs and rankings of the committees will appoint conferees. And you, that's when it gets really fun. You duke out the final bill, uh, you bring it back to the floor, you'll pass the full bill, and then it will go to uh, the president for signature. Now, I think because this is for CLE credit and we're with a bunch of lawyers here, uh, I'll just mention the, the 2008 farm bill uh, was vetoed by President Bush. And during the floor debate on the, on the Senate side, the uh, general counsel of the Senate Ag Committee ran down to the floor with a letter. She was panting as she's running down with this letter from the White House that said, your reforms to Title I all right, this is shocking now, right? This, the revisionist history is shocking. Your reforms to Title I did not go far enough. I'm going to veto this bill, no matter how high your vote count is. So President Bush vetoed the bill, right? It went back then to the House to override the veto. When the House is, is looking at this bill to get their whipping the vote count for the veto override, they said, oh my God, the president signed the bill into law with a missing trade title. There were 33 pages of the bill that were missing during 2008. So constitutional crisis, right? What happens next, yeah. right? The, the House then proceeded with the veto override. But in the meantime, the clock is ticking on permanent, permanent law kicking in uh, because the Farm Bill was set to expire at the end of the week. <laughs> so they then quickly wow. passed a, 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 a two-week extension. Uh, then this went over to the Senate, the Senate overrides the veto, but then the House and Senate have to repass the full, the full bills all over again, went back to the president who vetoed the bill, then it went back for a, a veto override again. So 2008 at the very end uh, was a very uh, interesting interesting time. And I, I, it just goes to show um, the importance of a good paralegal and compi <laughs> compiling, compiling the, the final document. Yeah, that nail, you're exactly right. Um, that 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 is a legendary story of farm bill lore, and um, one we've been able to avoid in subsequent farm bills. But uh, it it goes to show, like, there's a lot of mechanics to this process, and um, it's especially complicated when uh, you're you're facing two vetoes and you know a total of like ten votes on the bill. Um, so uh, earlier. Um, Chuck mentioned that you know resource constraints are going to be a big um, uh, a big problem, not necessarily a problem, but a theme in this upcoming farm bill, as was at, as has been the case in re at practically every recent farm bill. Um, Jonathan and Tina, uh, you both were um, leaders in the Senate Act Committee during the 2014 farm bill when uh, committee leadership set a target to cut 23 billion from the farm bill. Uh, and they and and you guys made it. And that was passed into law by President Obama. Uh, Jonathan, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, was that a fun task? I uh, I blame Tina for that. Um, <laughs> the no, it was not. It was it was an awful undertaking and it took three years, two Congresses. Uh, we passed the bill twice in the Senate before the House ever got anything done. Um, and I would say, and and I would take what Chuck said, and I would take it even further, which is I think the budget scenario or the budget regime that we operate under, this idea of congressional budget office estimates and the baseline, the scoring mechanisms, all of that has drastically warped the way we write policy, pass policy, negotiate programs, and you see that in a farm bill. And 2014 is a great example because it, it was the result of uh, a change in Congress in the House in which the, the new Republican majority over there came in, you know, hardcore using the budget weapons they could, they could find to attack the administration. And it ends up in this just messy, messy budget cutting fight. And so I think, you know, one of the key things, and, and Tina's absolutely right on the process and all that, 
But I think there's this overlay with the budget that has just completely warped the way we do it. And my favorite example of this, when farmers, you know, when people are like, what do you, you know, what do you mean by that? So if you look at the ARC County program, uh, you know, the program has many challenging aspects. One of the things that's fascinating about it is it triggers payments at 86%. And everybody always was like, why 86%? Well, the only reason it's 86% is because we couldn't afford 88% or 90% <laughs> based on CBO scoring. It has yeah. no actual connection to what the payment should be or what the farm loss or risks are. It is a complete budget-driven component. And so to your point, I think to what Chuck laid out also, in a farm bill discussion that we call sort of a baseline farm bill, which means there's no additional spending, there's no expectation for additional spending, you're stuck in the zero sum game of this is what CBO thinks each program is going to spend. If you try to increase one or the other or one title or the other, you got to cut somewhere else to offset it, which creates a brutal political situation. Even worse, if if the new Congress decides their uh, their budget cutters again, uh, they're going to come in and try to demand reductions. Then we're back in the same situation that Tina and I lived through in the 14 Farm Bill and you as well, which uh, which was this whole mess of cutting things back and finding ways to take the benefits that people sort of understand in these programs, take them away from. Them. And, and it's just it's an awful scenario. So I think we, we need to all kind of really wrap our heads around just how much the budget process drives the policy making process these days. So, Jonathan, in your answer, you referenced that ARC triggers at 86% of, uh, finish the thought for for folks um, listening and maybe explain what that revenue program is and, you know, how it fits in. I'd hate to do that to the audience here because uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a complex, messy program. It's a revenue program and revenues are yeah. prices and yields. And so 86% is the trigger point of payments. And so we go back and we look for five, we look at the five most recent years and we average those out, dropping the highest and lowest. And that gives us this benchmark. And then we base our guarantee at 86% of that. And so if in the crop year, the average county, for example, yields and prices equal something below 86%, we trigger a payment on the difference. So it's this kind of strange calculation that we design up as a way to approximate what might be risk factors on the farm or at, at the local, more local level, like the county level. Um, it is a complicated right. program, but it, you know, sorry, you were about to ask something. No, it's good. I I, I pulled out what I wanted. I, I just wanted to give uh, folks a sense that ARC's a revenue program. If if a, if a producer has a disappointing year, um, the, the producer might be entitled to um, you know, a modest payment from USDA, provided that the whole county experiences a similar year. Is that fair characterization, Jonathan? That is. And I, and I, I want to stress crop insurance is sort of the frontline risk protection or risk management component. So right. really, these Title I payments happen a year after the fact. They're very much an approximation of what may have happened. When you talk about farm risk, and Chuck and Tina both sort of bring up some of the farm you know, risk realities, that's the crop insurance program. That's where we're buying policies subsidized by the federal government and we trigger indemnities based on an actual loss at the farm based on the crops we grow. The Title I programs, you don't have to plant the crop to get the payment. So it's a kind of bizarre uh, system that, that sits outside, frankly, the, the functional realities of farm. Right, that's a good point. Uh, you know, for... Um, I don't know, since at least 2014, uh, the policy um, has been to uh, push more producers onto um, a crop insurance risk management mitigation strategy and, and perhaps rely less on uh, something like commodity title payments. Um, there's one idea that's been kicked around, um, and I'd like to hear your comments on it, Chuck. Um, you know, some uh, stakeholder groups have floated this idea of a, uh, a continuous or a permanent disaster program. Uh, what are you hearing on that, Chuck? Some would consider uh, crop insurance, as we've just been discussing, as a, uh, as a disaster type of program. Yet we know <clears throat> that that's not what the 
uh, political leaders would see. And I tell you what, it, it's reflected from their districts. So when you have a, a weather event, say a hurricane comes in, flood events, uh, there's been a lot of fires that have swept through uh, production areas as well, because too often we forget about timber fires as well, uh, or t lumber production. Um, the legislators like to respond in a very quick fashion and then a very distinct fashion with disaster program. So while it's discussed at a regular uh, level, it is not practically implemented. And, and the other thing is politicians like to hand out their disaster payments uh, in response to show that they're doing something. So yeah, it's some I think some, Jonathan will have a comment on that in a minute. Yes, <laughs> he will. And it's somewhat self-fulfilling from that, that per, uh, perspective. So there is discussions about it. I always like to back to people that I've interacted with that have had a history. And I, I respect what Tina was saying from the standpoint about the lore of how things can grow in importance. Um, and, you know, we, we see uh, the, crop in, the crop insurance and risk management programs are, are something that governments can be best used when planning for crisis more than they can be planning for uh, business. And I know that's one perspective. There may be others that have different feelings, but if you think about it, they're great at wars, they're great at defense, they're great at responding when there's national emergencies. They're pretty bad at predicting or helping the business climate flourish or innovation. We're also very challenged on an innovation front. Um, some, like I said, there's always difference of a perspective, but when it comes to the business versus the state of government, I think you're still going to see disaster programs come out of of uh, Congress and to the producers. I, I think you're right. I think it's gonna be a proposal. Um, in this budget constrained environment, um, it, it'll be difficult. Jonathan, what, what do you think about the idea of a, of a permanent disaster program? How, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that in a nice way. I, I, I think, I think Chuck made a really, really important point that needs to be built out from, and that is in terms of actual disasters on the farm, disasters from weather, even in crop year, disasters in terms of market prices are covered. In most cases, the farmer can buy up to 85% coverage under crop insurance. So we have a very functional, very effective crop insurance program that is highly subsidized runs anywhere between eight and $10 billion a year in federal outlays, according to the budget, Congressional Budget Office. So we have arguably a great disaster program in place right now. So I have a hard time understanding sort of where we squeeze something else in, how we do it and why we do it. And what do we take away from? Again, I, I highlight more than anything, the zero sum nature of this farm bill budget regime. If members wanna add, uh, uh, disaster program. It doesn't just score one year, it'll score for 10 years. So you take whatever number that disaster program is, you multiply it by 10. Now you got to go back into the farm bill and cut some other program or series of programs to actually pay for that new disaster program. Obviously, and, and, and this is not to stir controversy, but it's just reality. If you're going to create a standing disaster program, then you're probably needing to cut either Title I programs or crop insurance or some combination of both because that's where you're squeezing this new sort of policy into place. My final comment, and you know, I, I don't admit to be an objective observer on this. I lived through the 2008 Farm Bill when we created a standing disaster program with Tina. Uh, and then I lived through it trying to implement it down at USDA. And what I will say is that standing disaster programs, because you have to squeeze them into this space, not only in spending, but in design, become extraordinarily complicated very difficult to implement and operate and tend to not be at all what people seem to think they're doing when they design it. And I think these should all be blaring warning, warning signs to any of this discussion about creating some new standing disaster program, unless we want to wipe out Title I and start over as that creates some kind of uh, new program. That makes sense. So Jonathan, what I'm hearing is we have a farm safety net uh, that functions well for many producers in this country. And what I'm hearing from Chuck is that regionally there, um, there, there's probably some differences of opinion as to how well it's working. And that'll be the task of 
the House and Senate Ag Committee. Um, sounds like a farm bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I mentioned at the top, you know, the farm bill is like, it's way more than just ag, ag policy, but um, uh, within the food and ag industry and within the ag community, it's the it's a topic that that um, garners outside attention. I want to transition to another really important topic of the farm bill, um, which is one that I think will uh, have uh, garnered significant attention. Chuck mentioned it, which is the conservation title. Now, Tina, uh, in the 2014 farm bill, you were responsible for shepherding the the conservation title to the finish line. And you did a fantastic job. And it was kind of a brown, groundbreaking conservation title. Can you just give us this, just the most basic summary of what the conservation title does in the Farm Bill? Very simply put, it is and should be considered part of the risk management program for, for your farm. Right, right, full stop, I think the end. Uh, I think Title II of the Farm Bill, which is the conservation title, and Title I and crop insurance should be considered all, all of and one in the same, right? The conservation title is responsible for $6 billion a year of mandatory spending every single year that goes directly to farmers, right? Doesn't go to organizations, right, entities, it goes to farmers. Uh, and I think that's really important. Um, you know, the mechanisms have changed, the programs have changed, but that point hasn't changed. I think the trend you see with the, the conservation title and the policies in the federal government on conservation and sustainability have gone from this nice to have sort of ancillary bucket of policy and programs to this must have. In the 2002 Farm Bill and the 2008 Farm Bill, you saw stakeholder organizations that were you know, conservation habitat uh, based or maybe quasi environmental based, but not so much. You know, now it's very mainstream. You have uh, for-profit food and ag companies, you have trade associations uh, sort of running the gamut. Uh, anybody who's, who's advocating uh, in the farm bill space, they have something to say about the conservation title now. And, and now that just hasn't been the case. Uh, so I think, things have really shifted. Uh, one of the things that is very unique about uh, the conservation title is the delivery mechanism for which how this money gets paid out to farmers. And it is through the, the technical assistance budget at USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. They have a, a delivery system that is built on um, history from the Dust Bowl, uh, where we have boots on the ground uh, in the United States delivering conservation to farmers. There is a, a fairly significant change made uh, that we at Land Lakes advocated for in the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, which was under this technical assistance provision to utilize uh, farmer-owned cooperatives and ag retailers to deliver this technical assistance uh, through that trusted network and advisor that worked with farmers every day to not duplicate or, or replicate jobs and who's talking to these farmers. And, and that's something we will and are advocating for every day. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue to work on that going forward. Uh, but one thing I wanna mention there too that I see as a trend, Jack, is the rural development title. Right. You're starting to see more organizations move into this space, too. And I, I think this trend of moving from a nice to have to a must have uh, is something is something for for farm bill folks to continue to watch uh, the, the rural development title, as you well know, Jack, is um, I'll say parochial. <laughs> uh, it is it is it is pretty difficult. It's very siloed. It is a cobbled together machination of 25 uh, different um, different laws underneath that title of the bill. It's very complicated. Uh, there is no mandatory funding. Uh, I think the, the, the very large infrastructure bill that passed in a bipartisan way earlier this year, last year, uh, really showed us, do we have the capabilities in, in, um, uh, in the delivery system in rural places to get that money on the ground. I think we'll we'll start to see some of that and the economic development pieces come to light in in the farm bill. 
I, um, I'm really happy to hear you mention rural development as a, uh, a former employee at USDA rural development during the Obama administration, um, where I worked for undersecretary Tonsager. Um, e even when I was there, um, I could see the, the tie-ins between investments in infrastructure in in the countryside and rural America and some of our, our, uh, conservation and climate goals that relate to agriculture. Um, you've mentioned that in previous con conversations we've had, Tina. Do you see rural development and, and some of our climate work um, going hand in hand? Um, I don't think you could separate. I don't think you can separate any of this, right? I think you, you kicked this mm -hmm. panel off, Jack, by talking about pulling one string and it yanks out a thread somewhere else in the tapestry. I think that's exactly right. I think we have to think more holistically about these policies and, and how they fit together, whether that's climate and rural development or or crop insurance and and SNAP. Right. I think it's all it's, right. the food system is all interconnected. Right. It, it, so when I think of rural development um, it, for, for the audience, uh, rural development at USDA is the economic development arm. Um, of the department, and it is the um, only agency within the federal government that's exclusively dedicated to making infrastructure investments in, in the countryside. Uh, these investments are in housing, telecom, water, um, and uh, business and cooperative development. Uh, I see, and tell me if you agree, Tina, rural development playing a really important role in building out our, our broadband infrastructure that's probably going to be necessary for some of this precision ag um, and really um, high tech uh, approaches to farming that can be uh, climate smart and climate conscious. Do you see that yeah. playing a role? Yeah, Jack, thanks for, thanks for making the point. And I mentioned the infrastructure bill, uh, there were $65 billion in that bill for for broadband deployment, only $2 billion of that went to USDA. <laughs> yeah. uh, and as, as we, you know, in this, I, I'm looking at Chuck too, in the, in the rural cooperative space, you know, we have farmer owned cooperatives uh, in, in I'll like, give you an example in South, Southeastern United States who have zero connectivity at their grain elevators, at their agronomy locations. And they employ people certain days of the week, certain times a day to help farmers upload data to the cloud, right? The workarounds are insane that, that these local co-ops have and they've just had to deal with, right? We still have cooperatives that fax in orders because they they have zero connectivity, right? You can't even think about entering into a, a carbon market environment or offer if you don't have connectivity on the farm. So I think it's the great equalizer. We talk about it here at Land Lakes as being foundational to the future of agriculture to ensure that every farm and every barn is connected in the United States. And I think that's just foundational and fundamental for any farm bill going forward. Uh, Tina, I love hearing about your member co-ops and Chuck, I'm sure you're now thinking about uh, your member co-ops. Um, you know, on the 100th anniversary of the Capra Volstead Act, uh, I'm just inserting a personal comment that I, I think um, ag and rural cooperatives are, are so critical to all of this work we're doing. And, um, you know, especially the work at Land O'Lakes and Growmark and also CHS from our previous panel. Um, I'm going to transition to a different topic that I know all three of you are familiar with. Um, in previous farm bills and, you know, I get probably um, since all the way back to the O2 farm bill, Congress has emphasized this need to um, uh, invest in new and beginning farmers. I realized I'm quite a bit behind here. Um, you know, it's, here as we stand, the average age of the American farmer is 58 years old, um, and transition planning is underway. And I know this is important to uh, Land O'Lakes owners and Growmark's owners who are, you know, members of their member co-ops. Um, Jonathan, why is it so hard to to break in uh, for new and beginning farmers? So I, that's a great question, and I want to I want to do two things first. Which one, 
is just echo what Tina said about the importance of, of sort of looking across titles, across programs, and, and not being just locked in silo by silo for things, particularly around addressing climate and the amount of risk mitigation, management, and resiliency that we have to see through conservation investment. So I just, you know, was nodding my head uh, on that part. The other thing I want to plug first and foremost as a recovering attorney uh, is if, if there is nothing else remembered uh, when it comes to farm issues right now, and particularly the, this transition, is the desperate and dire need for more and better transition planning and, and, and addressing these issues in advance of the funeral. Um, because it is, it, the farmers are aging, the, the challenges of transitioning, the challenges of getting this, even to, you, to the sons or daughters um, in the next generation is, is just really, really difficult. And it is right. never a fun conversation. But it sort of jumps into exactly your question. There are an enormous set of barriers for beginning young farmers. They, they begin with land access, finding just the ground to farm. Uh, if you're not born into it, and again, that caveat, you're not born into it and your parents have set up a very functional transition plan and estate planning, you're, you're just way outside the, the game to begin with. Cash rents are through the roof, land prices are through the roof. So it is an enormous set of barriers to get started. That's before you got to buy expensive seed, increasingly expensive fertilizers. That's before the hundreds of thousands of dollars of, it, of iron that has to sit in a barn and use a couple times a year. It, it's just an incredibly expensive undertaking to get into. And so getting beginning farmers started, um, I mean, this is sort of one of those things that, 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 you sort of shake your head at or, or even knock your head against the wall because our food system is so dependent on being able to produce food through the future that, that we're watching this and we talk about this year in and year out that we have to get more farmers, more people into this. And yet we, we sort of all, you know, cheerlead around this and then nothing or very few things actually get put in place. In fact, some of these programs and policies create further barriers for new farmers. And I'll just take Title I again as an example. The only way you get payments from the subsidy programs in Title I is if you have base acres attached to the farm, which right. means you base acres are a historic planning record. So a new and beginning farmer starts off with that set of challenges as well. Are they buying a farm with base acres? Are they able to get access to a farm with base acres? Crop insurance the same way. We've tried and passed farm bills to ease that transition for new farmers who say don't have the 10 year production history that we calculate crop insurance on to help them, you know, kind of incorporate previous uh, histories, uh, production histories to help them get insurance that's functional. But we got to do a lot more. We have to be thinking about not only new and beginning farmers, but expanding the farmer space, because as climate change continues to uh, wreak havoc, particularly in the, the West, particularly in places like I don't know, the Central Valley of California that produces most of our produce. Where are we going to make up that production when we need to? How are we going to offset that if we are not working at local community levels? Again, back to the rural development discussion. How are we developing some of those local food systems and that food production capability and the farmers that know how to do it, that know how to, to grow 10, 15, 20 crops in a 10 acre patch that they can take to a farmer's market. And so this topic, um, it gets the sort of right. Yeah, yeah, we got to help beginning farmers, but the 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 depth of the need and the and the complexity and difficulty of getting policy shaped around it is immense, and it needs a whole lot more attention, frankly, than I think we've given it uh, in recent years. Yeah, we're getting close. I mean, with the the average age of a farmer approaching sixty, you know, there we're the generational turn turnover needs to happen, and um, you know. <laughs> Jonathan, the comment you made about estate planning uh, is a is the exact same point Janie Hip made, who's the general counsel of USDA, at uh, the American Association of Ag Lawyers conference uh, last year in Salt Lake. She was adamant about it, and she wanted lawyers to get involved. So, to lawyers in the audience, there are opportunities to help with these transitions, especially where uh, the transitions are with folks with limited means. Um, Tina. Uh, same question to you. What, what what are your thoughts on this challenge, and and especially with respect to socially disadvantaged farmers? Do you yeah, what are you seeing yeah. out there? 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tossing that question over, Jack. I'm going to give you a personal example. When we moved, uh, when we left DC and moved back to the Midwest um, a number of years ago now, uh, I'm, I'm a farm kid uh, and it had been this bucket list dream of my mind personally to do uh, this, this class called Annie's Project. Annie's Project is put on by the farm credit system. It is this extraordinary uh, mini MBA program uh, for farm level economics for women taught by women. They do this in almost every state now and it's, it's underwritten by farm credit so it's very cheap. I enrolled, I did the program, it was phenomenal. I was getting all of my papers and finances in order uh, to, to purchase a farm. And this was very close to home farm uh, back home. Uh, I'm on the phone with Farm Credit. Uh, farm Credit says, Tina, looks great. Uh, next step, I need you to put your husband on the phone. Uh, that didn't go well, Jack. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I, it, the point I wanna make is, the farm bill can include as many provisions as it wants to to lift up socially disadvantaged farmers but we need to be very real and have eyes wide open about the discrimination and the bias that exists at usda and the lending practices historically particularly for mm -hmm. black farmers i think about here in in minnesota for our Hmong farming community uh, and and there's a, there's a lot that the private se private sector can do and is doing right now uh, to 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 rethink the lending practices uh, for new and beginning and socially disadvantaged producers. Uh, Tina, thanks for sharing that story. And I, I think it, I mean, it's the perfect illustration of some of the challenges at USDA. USDA is the the federal government department that has been. Um, the subject of the largest civil rights um, settlement in the history of the United States government, the Pickford settlement. And uh, we still have work to do. Um, and uh, it sounds like this, the, the hang up with you wasn't necessarily USDA, but farm credit system. Um, it's a, it's a broader issue and um, we need young leaders in agriculture to, to take it head on. Um, running close and, you can at the time here, we have three minutes. I'm gonna kick it to the panel, um, to anyone who wants to chime in. Um, uh, why is the Farm Bill Im important to your organization? Um, and that's a leading question, so I'll back it out. Why is it uh, important to your organization, if it is at all? Yes, I will start. Uh, as a farmer-owned cooperative, we are only as strong as the rural communities and the farmers that own us. And like I mentioned uh, at the top of the panel, um, the Farm Bill is, is simply a vehicle for policy to move. Uh, and and uh, it is something that we pay very close attention to and will continue to advocate for every step of the way as we go forward, uh, particularly alongside our farmer-owned cooperative brethren uh, here, uh, Growmark on the panel and CHS on the panel prior. Thanks, Tina. Chuck? I, I like that statement. And yes, a farmer owned cooperative, as Tina pointed out, <clears throat> Land O'Lakes, CHS, Growmark. We just took 25 people to the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives fly in in Washington, D.C., and talked about the need for a Title I uh, crop insurance, what we've got to continue to do to advance farm policy, and then what that means for the farm economy. Uh, it's critical. We heard about the lack of coverage for internet service, I want to tell you that uh, I think, as you pointed out and where we started, <clears throat> the Ukrainian events, worldwide events, have driven home the importance of food production systems for our national security, but our own personal securities on a daily basis. We really take for granted our accessibility to food, and that's why it's important to have not only young farmers, but also food assistance programs to those in need. And then, Jonathan, I'll, I'm going to answer for you. It gives you a fascinating area of research. Is that about right? I mean, very personally, sure. I've I've probably spent more time than sanity or or my hairline would 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 allow uh, on the farm bill and farm bill research. But I I also want to take a different plug from from an organizational standpoint as uh, as a, uh, a member of a wonderful, outstanding land grant university in what is honestly to this day a shocking jewel in the American uh, system. Agreed. 
that we have public land grant universities that we fund them. Uh, they're authorized and reauthorized in farm bills. I mean, the, the actual research dollars go through appropriation, but it is this incredible, incredible system for bridging technology, bridging challenges. And it ties back into what we were saying about young and beginning farmers. Where are the students that we see at the University of Illinois coming from? Fewer and fewer are students who grew up like Tina, Chuck, and myself on a farm and you on a farm, right? They're coming from cities and suburbs. They're bringing diverse perspectives and they need access to an understanding of the food system, food supply, production, risk, all of this. And so, you know, I, I put in a plug for the land grants across the board and what we can what what we can provide and the avenues and access points and opportunities that, that come through it. And so um, the farm bill is important, uh, I would say, across the board. Um, and I appreciate I appreciate you having me on this panel. I really appreciate a chance to be able to not talk just to you, Jack, but to be uh, to hear Tina's wisdom and Chuck's wisdom again. Uh, maybe maybe help uh, help clarify thoughts on, on things. I, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And uh, if anyone is interested in learning more about the history and politics of the Farm Bill, which is genuinely fascinating, I encourage everyone to get Jonathan's book, The Fault Lines of Farm Policy. Uh, it's great. Um, really fascinating read. Tina, Chuck, Jonathan, thank you guys for a great event. Um, I'm I'm so glad that Dorsey's clients in the food and ag space um, got a chance to kind of uh, be a fly on the wall in a conversation among people who are um, very much in this space. Um, and also, I hope gain an appreciation for why this legislation is important for their businesses. So thank you guys so much. And now uh, I'll, I'm going to kick it to Morgan for brief closing remarks. Thanks, Jack. And thanks to all of our panelists for sharing your insight and time today. We're grateful to have you and all of you in attendance today as part of Dorsey's food and agribusiness community. Uh, please remember to submit your CLE forms to attendance at dorsey.com so you can get credit for showing up. If you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to Jack or Gage directly or to any of your Dor trusted Dorsey contacts. We are here to help. On behalf of the Food and Agribusiness Industry Group, thank you for your continued partnership with Dorsey and Whitney. Have a great day.